International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. This is Sierra Bailey here with InternationalMediaTV.com. We're here at Merritt College, prepared to hear Bobby Seal speak. He's going to tell us a little bit about um, social justice. We're going to learn a little bit of the history of the Black Panthers. This year is their 50th anniversary. Um, everybody's coming in, taking their seats, and things are about to get started in less than 10 minutes. At this time, um, I'm going to bring up the Honorable Elu Harris, but when you say the honorable, some people want well, why is the honorable? But I, 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 th there's reasons behind that when we, when we say that. Um, Elihu Harris served for 12 years as a member of the California State Assembly. And in that time, he authored the historic 1981 legislation designating Dr. King's birthday as a California state holiday. <laughs> After serving in the California State Assembly, he went on to become the 46th mayor of the city of Oakland. <laughs> and after that, to go on to become the chancellor of the Peralta Community College District. When we, think of, when we think of leaders, um, we think of those who are doing things now, but we, we also look at those who are paving a way and building bridges for those who will come after them. And although some may say that Elihu Harris, the Honorable Elihu Harris has retired, we know that he is still positively working to shape the lives of youth and people older for days to come. Please help me welcome the Honorable Elihu Harris to the stage. Thank you very much. Royal, thank you very much to the Chancellor, to the President, certainly to all of the Merritt community and our great community. I'm very happy to be here, uh, not only to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Black Panthers, but to remind you that the struggle continues. Yeah. Let me take you back just a moment. Uh, by the way, if you haven't seen Merritt College, Home of the Black Panthers, which is a film produced by Jeff, Jeff Heyman and my wife, Dr. Sheila Wells, then you ought to look at that so you really get a pictorial glimpse of young people 50 years ago making a change, taking a stand, putting their lives at risk because it was that important to make a change. If you don't have that in your heart, as Martin Luther King said, if you don't have something which you're willing to die, you're not fit to live. So think about your contributions. Think about what you do every day. <laughs> think about what you do every day, because any of you who think you live in a post-racial America are very confused. You know, a lot of us think because we got nice cars, some of us live in nice neighborhoods, some of us got good jobs. The things have changed, but things are very much the same. 50 years ago, Bobby Seale and Huey Newton and the Black Panthers were confronting racial police officers. You think that's changed in Oakland? You think that's changed in America? No, it hasn't changed, and it won't change. But black lives have not only got to matter to the police, they got to matter to us too. This is an institution of learning. 50 years ago, as I was in high school, 
And I saw Huey Newton and Bobby Seale and David Hilliard. And all those guys were just a little older than I was. But they were on the streets talking, organizing, doing things in community service that I thought was admirable. But I said, well, I'm too young. Uh, it's too dangerous. I'm not going to get out there like those fools. I'm going to college. They were already in college and they were doing it. So if you're in college, you're just getting an education, but you're not serving your community, you're not really getting an education. So I want to tell you, I'm happy. Oh, by the way, for those of you who came to Merritt College tonight, it's a beautiful campus. But you saw the most lit up building on the campus. You know it's named after Barbara Lee, the Barbara Lee Building. It's the Barbara Lee School of Allied Health. And when I was in college with Barbara Lee, when I got out of law school, I had a job. But Barbara Lee gave me another job. She didn't pay anything, but you know how she is. <laughs> Barbara Lee in Berkeley started the community health, it's changed, community health, go ahead, Barbara. Alliance for labor. Health Alliance for Growth and Education okay. in West Berkeley to families to get counseling for mental health, for families to stay together. I mean, even as a student, she understood what change was all about before even she dreamed of being an elected official. And as I've said before, when I was in the state legislature, for the last 10 years I was there, every day I saw Barbara Lee, she said, when are you going to get out of my seat? <laughs> when I ran for mayor, she said, well, it's about time. <laughs> and as you know, she went to the legislature. She served there in the Assembly and the State Senate. And then after that, she, well, this is where she is now. Our Congresswoman, the only woman who had the courage to vote against the war in Iraq and to give them <laughs> And she's still fighting against the Republicans. You talk about the evil empire. If you think Darth Vader was bad, let Donald Trump become president. He is your father. And when they say they want to make America great again, you know what they're saying? They want to turn back the clock. They want to go back to pre-civil rights. They want to go back to pre-voting rights. They want to go back to segregation. They want to put us back in the bus and out of the country. And I'm telling you, if you don't stand up now, you're going to sit down for a long time after that. And if you think the most important thing on the ballot in November is who's going to be the president, you are out of your mind. That seat on the Supreme Court is going to determine all of our lives and our children's future. Do not be confused by politics as usual. We are not in that era anymore. We're fighting for power and control. The Panthers fought for black power. We need to fight for human power and the human race. We're about to go back into the Neanderthal cavemen days if these fools ever get in charge again. So, so finally, let me say this. I remember Bobby Seale preaching on the corner. He would stand on anything he could find, a chair, a brick, anything a little taller than the pew crowd he was talking to. He would speak the truth to power. He put his life on the line, imprisoned. I mean, you can't begin to believe the kind of courage that he and the Black Panthers had in the 60s and 70s. When you're, when you're under invasion by the FBI and the CIA and all the other cloaks of darkness that we have in this country, you have the courage to continue to fight what manner of strength and what manner of man do we have in front of us today? I used to go to the meeting, but I'd sneak in and sneak out before the FBI saw me. I was scared to death. 
But those guys, you know, and there were a whole lot of pretenders to the Panthers. People who wore berets and had leather coats. Man, they didn't have nothing to do with the Panthers. But they, they'd walk behind them like they were in the crowd, you know. <laughs> and then they'd peel off when the trouble started. But Bobby Seale, I, I, we're just so blessed that you're here today, that you're alive, you're well, and you're going to share your knowledge and your history with all of us. Because people need to know who you are, what you did, and what we need to do to maintain your legacy. Brother, we are in the Bobby Seale and Huey Newton Lounge at Merritt College. is named after you. Take pride in being here tonight because we have pride in your life and your legacy. Thank you, brother. At this time, I have the honor and the privilege of introducing the congressperson who speaks for me, and she speaks for you, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. <laughs> I'm still going to say it. Can I still say it? Can I still say it? Barbara Lee speaks for me. Here she is. <laughs> okay, Bobby, power to the people. Power. <laughs> good evening. It's good to be home. Gosh. First, Dr. Norma Ambrose Galavis. No, thank you so much for your continuing support and leadership of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center as well as this great community college. So give Norma another round of applause. <laughs> really appreciate your diligence and commitment. And also to our Chancellor Laguerre, thank you so much. I tell you, you're continuing to lead Peralta in its reputation of excellent education for this community, for young people, middle-aged people, older people. You, you know, this uh, Peralta Community College is a, is a community college system that everyone in the country wants to know about and they're jealous of because you do it right. And so thank you for making sure that, that our students here are prepared not for the jobs of yesterday, but for the jobs of tomorrow. So thank you so much. And also sometimes we forget we don't have any of our great historically black colleges and universities west of the Mississippi, but Merritt is what we finally got designated a predominantly black institution, a PBI. And so the only one west of the Mississippi. So we're eligible for a lot of what we would not get if it hadn't been then Chancellor Harris. When he was here, that's when we got that designation. First, and to um, Elihu and to Sheila, let me just uh, thank you first for your friendship, but also for your constant and consistent support and help of, for our young people at the Freedom Center. And I always say Elihu and Sheila could be doing other things, but they're still on the case, working each and every day, making sure that our young people have a future, the future that they deserve. Now, I met Elihu in the, I'm not gonna tell too many stories about you, Elihu, tonight, but he was a student, I was a student in Mills College. He was at, you were at Bolt then, I think, UC Berkeley. And um, some of our deepest and most, <laughs> I would say enthusiastic discussions had to do with the Black Panther Party because I was out there with Bobby and Elaine and Erica and Huey as a community worker. And Elihu and I, we used to debate and talk about the role and the importance of the Black Panther Party. And it was during that period that I really, first of all, met Shirley Chisholm and registered to vote. <laughs> But it was also during the uh, early 70s that I met then chairman comrade Bobby Seale. It was during that period, and I want to remind us of a couple of things tonight, just in terms of the history of Bobby and the Black Panther Party. First of all, the Black Panther Party, under the leadership of Bobby Seale and Huey Newton, they initiated 
what now the federal government finally decided to do, and that was the free breakfast programs for children. <laughs> Took the Panthers to do that. Took them to do that. Back, the Black Panther Party highlighted the issue of police misconduct and police brutality way back then. And, and Bobby, I just have to say, today we had the Oscar Grant Foundation with at least 12 to 15 mothers of, of young men who had been killed by the police throughout the country. And it was quite a moving and powerful meeting today, but I had to, and Erica was there, and I had to think about what you all were doing and saying way back then in the day about the role of, of the police in our community and police misconduct. And so the Panthers, once again, led the way on all of these very, very tough issues that we're still, in, still dealing with today. They were the vanguard of, of the revolution, the vanguard party of the revolution. Also, it was during that period in the early 70s when the Black Panther Party decided that they wanted to exercise their political power. And Bobby, I'll never forget, I was his fundraising coordinator when he ran for mayor of Oakland. They had the best precinct operation and grassroots organized effort in the city of Oakland or anywhere I have ever seen in the country. And Bobby made it into the runoff. And that paved the way for our first African-American mayor to be elected, Mayor Lionel Wilson. But it had, had it not been for Bobby Seale, that never would have happened. It never would have happened. Also, during that period, I mentioned that I had first time registered to vote for Shirley Chisholm with Sandra Swanson, Wilson Rounds Jr., Sandy Gaines. Well, the Black Panther Party and Bobby Seale and Huey Newton and Elaine and Erica and all the comrades in the party, they endorsed Shirley Chisholm for president. We took almost 10% of the vote in Alameda County. And I just have to tell you, Shirley Chisholm used to talk to me about how proud she was, Bobby, of your endorsement of her in her presidential campaign and how badly needed the Black Panther Party was during that period. And so she was bold, she was visionary, and she stood with Bobby Seale throughout that time. The young people at the Freedom Center, I just have to say to them how proud I am of all of you. They are amazing young people who I have gotten to know. They travel with me. I have the privilege to go with John Lewis and others to the pilgrimage to Selma Montgomery, Birmingham every year. We're getting ready to go to Charleston in a couple of weeks. They went with me to Memphis when we reopened the Civil Rights Museum. So these young people have a chance to move around the country and to meet our heroes and sheroes and foot soldiers and leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. When we went to Memphis, Tennessee with the Freedom Center, Bobby Seale came. Bobby spoke at the opening of the Civil Rights Museum. And Bobby, I'm just so proud of the fact that you were there speaking and that the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee has a major exhibit about Bobby Seale and the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California, in Memphis. And of course, our young people with the Freedom Center, they were on the front page of the newspaper all over the country walking in the parade as we reopened the Civil Rights Museum. So I want you to know these are wonderful ambassadors for Oakland and for the East Bay, all of our young people here at the Freedom Center. They go all around the world, you know, making us very proud. We started the Freedom Center in the 90s, uh, Ira Dinkins, Charlie Mae Davis. We, the young people and our senior citizens came to Sacramento and said they wanted to have a center for nonviolence, conflict resolution, uh, mediation, and the environment. And we actually worked then with Pete Wilson, the governor. <laughs> But he did sign the memorandum of understanding, but it was because busloads of people from Oakland, California, young people, senior citizens, came to Sacramento and said, we want to have a Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. And they did it. And that was the, their first exertion of political power. So I just have to say, you guys have withstood the test of time. So please support the Freedom Center, because they make us so proud with everything that they do. And so now I just want to bring forward the man of the hour, 
the person who I have known for many, many, many years, where's my nephew? Lamont is here from Los Angeles. He remembers Bobby Seale and all of us out selling newspapers and survival rallies and, and the chairman really conducting the PE classes we all went to. I mean, Bobby Seale was a community worker, but he was also chairman of the Black Panther Party. And so he, he educated this community like many of you remember and believe. And now with Black Lives Matter, which Black Lives Matter? Yeah. Black Lives Matter? <laughs> Elihu and I and Roy and Karen and the staff of the Martin Luther King Freedom Center couldn't think of any person more relevant to this time, more appropriate to be with us tonight during Black History Month, more clear, clear and, and more committed as he has ever been to make sure that black lives matter and that we see the change in this country that the Black Panther Party stood for, worked for, fought for, and, and many, many, many sacrificed so much for. So Bobby Seale, thank you. We honor you tonight. Come on up, Mr. Chairman, comrade Bobby Seale. Power to the people, all power to the people. Give Bobby Seale a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm looking around here to see that I see the other members of my family. Did they get here? Abraxas, Shelley, besides my daughter and my wife outside? Oh, oh okay, they're over there. No, I can't see. <laughs> uh, thank you. You know, I get up every morning and I go to the gym. I've been doing this since I was 47. And uh, of course I stopped drinking beer and smoking so many years ago. But it was like I had things to do, you know what I mean? And I cannot run down my system anymore. And uh, I uh, look around and see various things happening. You know, Nelson Mandela came out of prison and I remember myself going to San Francisco. There was a South African sort of a consulate extension of the United Nations place in San Francisco where we protested. It's the first time I carried a placard. 1963 and um, they came down and arrested us put us in a paddy wagon drove us 10 12 blocks away and let us out of the paddy wagon we went back and forth later we was up around University of California getting petitions signed to end apartheid and free Nelson Mandela that was in 1963 in 1962 I uh, was a young man. I was working at Kaiser Aerospace and Electronics. Kaiser Industries is right here. And uh, I had landed this great job. You know, my whole career, a life of work. It's like I was a lucky young guy, you know, to be raised a carpenter and a builder beginning at age seven when my father built our first house in Port Arthur, Texas. He built it from the ground. My father was a master carpenter and builder. My grandfather was a master carpenter and builder, Arch Seal. And we come from the Seal family, from the Seal Plantation in uh, East Texas. This is where both my mother and father were born. They were born in the county of Jasper, Jasper, Texas the same county where some 15, 20 years ago a young brother was drugged to death by Ku Klux Klanus. And my niece, my uh, uh, daughter, my sister's daughter, looked up our genealogy and found that that brother who was drugged to death was six cousins to our family. 
My people are from Jasper, Texas. My grandpa built the town, or well, he built 500 houses in what we call Weirgate, Texas, near the Louisiana border. Um, these, these old men that I grew up with, they taught me. My father taught me to be a hunter and a fisherman. I mean, it's like when I was 13 years of age, I was an expert shot with a 30-30 Winchester, hunting deer, hunting bear, what have you, et cetera. Of course, we hunted all over California, small game, big game, what have you, et cetera. But me, I was lucky. I was lucky because by the time I was a grown man, I, I had so many trades, skills, and professions, it was a crying shame. And as I say, I was working at, uh, in the engineering department at Kaiser Aerospace Electronics. You know, and uh, when Ronald Reagan called me a hoodlum, when I led that armed delegation to the California State Legislature, when I led that armed delegation, I, my organization was only about six months old, six or seven months old. I mean, we were a ragtag organization. I'm talking about, I did, what, did, what did I have, 15? Mem 15, 16 real members. And then Mark Comfort, he joined with us. Mark Comfort had, was protesting in his own right against the Tribune, et cetera, the uh, Oakland Tribune. And uh, he joined us. And then we had the Dow brothers and family out in North Richmond. Well, we went out there to check out and deal with Denzel Dow. And we wound up looking one day in Malford, state of Simmons, Malford, was trying to put a bill through to stop us from uh, observing police. And why did we even go out there for police? Well, I'm gonna tell you why. I was later on, and by that time, I'm working for the city government of Oakland, California, Department of Human Resources. I'm the community liaison for the North Oakland Neighborhood Service Center. And what's happening here in that poverty program, that warm poverty program, is 1965 coming around, that book jumped out, Black Power. And I read portions of the book and then I saw some other brothers standing on the corner, we want black power, we want black power. But, yeah, right on. I says, but you know, uh, we don't have enough politicians, black politicians to get any black power. What you talking about, man? I said, man, you can sit up here and it's good that you up here, but I says, but we have to have some uh, power, and then we have to, therefore we have to have some political power seats. And in that time, working there, et cetera, running the youth jobs program, et cetera, I did my other little research. And I looked across America and tried to find out how many black politicians was duly elected at that time in the middle of the 1960s. How many was elected to the office at this time? And I'd gotten up to 50, including Adam, Adam Clayton Powell. I only found 50. Now, me, I love mathematics and the demographics and all that stuff. You know what I mean? I says, now, wait a minute. How many political seats are there? Yes, yeah, 52 counties here in California, boom, 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 et cetera, boom, 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 all this stuff. I says, wow, and I got to looking around, and I came up with 500,000 political seats that one can be elected to in the United States of America when you encompass all of them from the lowest local level to the federal level. And most I'd count as 50. Oh, you probably could have found some more, 10 or 15 or 20. But I'm telling the brothers and sisters, y'all, we have to have some political power seats. And this is the real reason that I started the Black Panther Party. This is where it came from. You know, I'm still working for the city government even when we got to the party, you know? Me and Bertram Morrell, we was on Merritt College there, and we organized a big rally on the campus, you know, that we was not gonna let ourselves fight in the war in Vietnam anymore. I mean, we did a play, we did everything, et cetera, et cetera. And we also put together black history, and got it in the curriculum at Merritt College, et cetera. We were the ones that did the work at my house. My house was right across the street from Merritt College was in on the, when it was on the flatlands down at the place. And we put that together. We worked at it and put those syllables together, you know? I mean, I remember those days. You know, I had a great job. I had good money, et cetera. And I had to find out more and more history. 
and I was following up with some reference to a Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner. I had digested this work, Myth of the Negro Past, Myth of the Negro Past by Marvel J. Herskovitz, some anthropological dissertative thing, you know, destroying and killing all the myths historically through slavery, what have you, et cetera, about us as black folks and so on. And there I was up at Mar University of California trying to find this work, Surviving Africanisms and Black Language that he had made reference to. And then he told me I couldn't check this out. I says, I can't check it out. Wow, where are you matriculated? I said, I'm down at Merritt College. Well, you got to have a special uh, library card. I says, what's that for? He says, it'll cost you 35 bucks. I said, here, here's the $35. Give me this card. Give me this book. And I went and digested that work, and I found out why we dropped all the T-H-E-R-A-R -R rolling R sounds, why we said dis, dat, dim, yo, mo, and fo, and, rather, and dropped the T-H-E-R-R sounds. Because what was happening in growing up, I remembered it right in one of the Cordonese's village. The teacher, black or white, would take a ruler and hit you on the knuckles. You're speaking pigeon language, and they don't understand, and I didn't understand, the reinforcing inferiority. But here, I loved anthropology. You know, I took every anthropology course that <laughs> Merritt offered at that time. I'm just saying, this is the thing that got me. And all that research, all that research about colonialism, et cetera, the exploitation of Africa, and so on, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. This was the one that got me. I was understanding why we said this, that, dim, yo, mo, and fo, rather than this, that, them, you are more and for. Why we drop the T-H-E-R-A-R rolling R sounds. Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner had done 12 years of field research from Senegal down to Angola and especially in the English speaking countries of Ghana and so on, et cetera, boom, boom. There were no T-H-E-R-A-R rolling R sounds in the West African languages. <laughs> Simultaneously, in another anthropology class, I'm dealing with the eugenics of racism coming out of England and saying that we did not, black folks had never evolved any agricultural sites. And I did a paper on that and found out that's bull crap. Cola nuts, peanuts, etc., was first cultivated. The stringy yam was first cultivated in West Africa. So, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I was into. And I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on because we got, with those things and, and the way we put that together, and, 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 and we, we put the black history there. At any rate, when I did that rally at Merritt College, we packed the room. I recited this poem called Uncle Sammy Called Me Full of Lucifer. I picked that poem up out of the Liberator magazine out of San Francisco. I mean, uh, excuse me, out of New York. A young brother wrote that, and I thought it was appropriate to voice a prose piece like that, you know, because we were being drafted to fight in Vietnam, and we read, and me and Birchall and I read in the newspapers that 29% of all the people dying on the front line in Vietnam was black Americans. And we're talking the 1960s, and I'm saying, why should we let ourselves be drafted anymore because this country is not recognizing our constitutional, democratic, civil, human rights? And that's one of the things that that protest evolved. With that, I created, Virtual Morell and I created Soul Students Advisory Council at Merritt College here. And uh, th that was the beginning. And Huey came down, because I left a message for him, you know, that we have a rally. You know, I talked to Huey at one point before that, right after Malcolm X was killed. And I said, we need to put another organization together. And what Huey says, well, they don't know their history well enough, and I'm in law school now, et cetera, and so on, that kind of stuff. And I says, well, okay, I says, I'm gonna organize something. But after that rally, Huey came at the tail end, and it blew his mind. He looked in the room at the tail end of the rally. We'd been there three hours. And all these people was raving about this poem, and Huey had opened the side door, and when I walked out to the side door, me, Virgil, Richard I. Oak, and some others, and he says, you organize all these people? I says, yeah. I said, I told you, man. I says, there ain't nothing we can organize. But uh, well, what are you doing now? I says, we're going to my house. 
what you gonna do at your house? I said, I got some barbecue. <laughs> I cooked a whole lot of ribs and chicken and potato salad and stuff, you know, in the backyard there. And this was for all the people at that rally who had signed up to be members of Soul Students Advisory Council. About 250 of them, about 150 showed up. And Huey was happy to go because, you know, Huey loved to eat. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I understand, and he, he just grieves, you know. <laughs> My point, though, that, those were those early days, you know. But then I also had this job down at the North Oakland Neighborhood Service Center. At another point, I recited that poem up on Telegraph Avenue, and it caused us to get into a fight with the Berkeley police. You know, it had a cuss word in it, and all of that, and he walks up, this undercover guy, he didn't even show his badge, he walked up saying, you're using obscene language. And I told him to get his hands off me, he had civilian clothes on me, I mean, he didn't, I didn't know he was a cop. You know, he's talking about I'm under arrest for using obscene language, and I'm cussing him out and telling him <laughs> that we, that the free speech movement just wanted the right to say the poor letter word all they want to, what you talking about, you know I mean? in the courts, you know, and uh, boom. But we got arrested, wound up in front of Judge Stats over here in the Alameda County Courthouse. And I told the judge, I says, Your Honor, now my friend Huey here says you can give us one to 10 years. John George was with us, but uh, we had to make a statement before sentencing because it was a no contest plea. And uh, I told him, I says, I work for the city government of Oakland. I have youth in the summer for a job, probably around 100 youth, et cetera. And I work to keep my kids out of jail. But it ain't right. The police lied. He said I was using obscene language. And in the preliminary hearing, he jumped up and said he told me I was blocking the sidewalk. I said he was a liar, Your Honor. And it's not right for me and Huey to be going to jail. Huey, being in law school, it says we could get one to 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, the judge gave us probation. And we got downstairs, I said, Huey, meet me at the Warren Poverty Center tonight. What? I said, I'm telling you, meet me tonight. I said, because we're going to finish this. I said, we could have been in jail, man, for 10 years, man. What's wrong with you? So we bet down there, everybody was off work. You know, I had the key and everything to get in and out of the place, et cetera, and so on. And we finished writing our rough draft of our 10-point program. And actually it was October the 10th. And my book sees the time, I wrote that book in jail and it was a hush, hush, rush book. And I said somewhere in the middle of October, the 15th of October we started. But it was the 10th that Judge Stats had said, give us probation. And that was when I went and finished writing that program. And we wanted power to determine our own destiny, our own black community. And my whole point was, to Huey, that we're going to organize a political electoral machine. What? Yeah, we're going to patrol the police, but you have to understand, patrolling the police was a tactic, a tactic in the, with guns, law books, and tape recorders. It was a tactic. The idea, as Huey would say, we'll capture the imagination of the people. I said, well, good. If we capture the imagination of the people, then I can help from there begin to organize a political electoral machine. That was the event. So, yeah, we got these guns, but I already had guns, but big man Albert Howard, he shot a gun over, it. Richard, Richard Aoki gave us two, three, four guns, you know, and stuff like this. But I trained these brothers. I wouldn't just hand somebody some gun. You know, I'd been in the military service. I knew the necessity of discipline and what have you, et cetera. And Huey, I insisted on him, you research every law in relation to the guns and our civil rights, every law. And we want to make sure that we're legal. And if we get arrested, we, we, we came out legal, and, and, and therefore we have a better chance. My point, though, is that we did that. We went out there, you know, and I had these, I had these brothers trained, you know what I mean? How to break those weapons down and put them back again. Because in the military service, I could break down an M1 carbine, you know, a, a blindfold it and put it back together again. That was the type of training I got even in the Air Force. I mean. We weren't far from the old Army Air Force in 1955 when I went in the United States Air Force. But I'm just saying, this is where we was at in 1966. 
And we got out there, and this one sister named Geraldine. Now, in the book, I wrote Mata Lava, but I was talking in a tape recorder that she was the first one. But this one particular sister that night was another sister named Geraldine with the long earrings and the afro, what have you, et cetera. And she couldn't afford a leather jacket. I said, sister, just buy, get, get a hold of the uh, uh, bush jacket, you know, the black khaki style bush jacket, what have you. And we all had guns, half had legal uh, long guns, half had, uh, had, had short guns. But in effect, we knew every law on the guns, every fish and game code law. law however, the gun was related whatever, from the Second Amendment rights and all the other rulings, et cetera, we had that down. We knew all of this. And the method was, is even Huey had researched it with his law professor. He was in Knight's private law school in San Francisco. You know, is that you can't go and say something first to the police. You have to let the per police first say something to you. Because if you say something first, you get busted for interfering with the police officer carrying out their duty, et cetera. So we knew all this stuff. And we get out of the car on 7th Street one night, but the second week of January on 7th Street, and we walked down because we saw him. I mean, I had a walkie-talkie. Huey had his father's car. I had my old Chevrolet. I had seven people, seven people in my car, and Huey had seven in his car. We was all bunched up in the cars, you know. We parked. We parked legally. I mean, I remember that old dumb movie that uh, Melvin Van Peebles and them made. You know, they had our wheels all up on the curve, and <laughs> you know what I mean. And and then Elderton wrote some old stuff about he, the baddest dude that ever sit two feet inside a hitch up. And that, 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 that's that old macho junk. That, 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 that wasn't how it was at, was at all. And we got out of the car and we walked down. Liquor store there, Slim Jenkins is somewhere along the street there on 7th Street, down there and whatever. As we come down, some sister nicely dressed saw us with our little uniforms on, you know, our little berets and our blue shirts and blue whatever, et cetera. Our colors were black and blue with our little guns. It's nighttime, 9 o'clock. Police car is kind of sitting in the street. A little arrestee is standing there with his hand at the back of the trunk. The police is actually on the right side, at the passenger side, with the door open, sitting inside, saying something on the radio as we walk up. I get everybody to stand in order, and they do. I said, look, step off the curb. They got off the curb. Some guy came out of the place, about 30, 40 people on the sidewalk down. And the old man say, what they got in their hand? Sticks or something? And the, another brother that knew who he was called him by name and said, man, them guns, be quiet. And so the cop sort of looked up, and then Huey turns around, and the old man said, I'm leaving. And Huey says, no one leave, please stay here. You have a right to stand and observe police officer. We researched the law, so oh, no one leave, everybody stand. By this time, this cop's got out in his car, and Huey turns around, and the cop says, you have no right to observe me. And Huey says, no, California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has a right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You got to hear this out. I'm telling you, we were reciting the law. Huey says, no, California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has a right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away or reasonable distance that particular ruling is constituted 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you, and we'll observe you whether you like it or not. And the sister on the sidewalk, she says, well, go ahead on and tell it. <laughs> now... I mean, when I look back on that, and, we, and, and, this, and when what was happening here is we're capturing the imagination of the people. We're disciplined. Nobody's one person. Because the point, of, and, 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 and the other point we told everybody, only one person talked. Because we, if, if and when we were arrested, we want to be able to go to court, and I only want all, I want, if it's 12, 13, or 14 of us, to be able to testify to the same thing. We had that thing laid out there. Anyway, that cop says, is that gun loaded? He would say, if I know it's loaded, it's good enough. Well, I have a right. He says, no, you have no right. He would cited something, United States Supreme Court, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Therefore, you cannot remove my property from it without due process of law. Step back. You cannot touch my weapon. And a tall black brother over there, he say, man, what kind of Negroes is these? <laughs> 
That's the way it happened. <laughs> right there in West Duncan on 7th Street. You know, and boom, the cop says, well, it, 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 he says, you can't touch my weapon, step back. You know what I mean? And boom, he said, load it. And then Huey says, clap, clap. he jacked a round in the chamber. <laughs> now, it was not a round in the chamber, that shotgun I'd bought Huey. Why? Because it was a law. While riding in the car, you cannot have a live round in a long gun such as a shotgun or a rifle while riding in the car. You could put it in the chamber where it could be shot once you got out of the car. He was says, clap, clap. He jacks around in the chamber. And when he jacks around in the chamber, all the other guys with long guns, clap, 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 clap. Well, that shook up everybody. <laughs> that, that caused the cop. See, the police officer really hadn't looked down to see. I had 14 other people down here with all these guns. You know, and bow, and he looks, he gets his arrestee, he puts him in the car, he's walking away, and he stops. The sister had these gold earrings on, and the light, whatever, was flicking, and he stopped to guess, obviously, to try to make sure one of them is a woman with a big 44 pistol that Richard Aoki had given her to wear. My point is, and he left, the police left. Some kids come running around the corner, telling some other kids, see, I told you, look at that, these are the new police to us. And I was, <laughs> but I'm telling you, that was it. And we went back to my house, and you know I love to cook, you know what I mean? So I always had food for people working with me. You, I'm a, I learned that mostly from my people on the farm, et cetera. But when I went into military service, you will be messing around, man. Met your people out here doing all that. Well, you better get some food out here. <laughs> you know, I always put, put food in, 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 in framework. Even when I created the Free Breakfast for Children program. I'm just saying that. That, that was what that was about. And my idea is that once we get the people going, but for that whole year, you know, from 66 to when we never had no more than 50 people in the Black Panther Party the first year. See, people may have thought we had, we didn't have no big numbers, but May 2nd, half that, halfway through that year, is when I led the armed delegation. That event, you know, and it was just an event because Moffat was up there for me to read executive mandate number one. And that's what I did. And then I wanted to go into the Capitol inside. I wanted to go to the spectator section because citizens have a right to somewhere sit in here. And man, I didn't know where it was. And a horde of 40, 50 press people are saying, this way, Bobby, this way, Bobby. We got guns, cameras, everything. <laughs> Five people get ahead of me. Mark Comfort and others got ahead of me with their rifles, and they walked in on the assembly floor. I didn't know where they was, they got ahead of me. And I walked up, I'm looking for the, I'm looking for the spectator section. I said, well, we're on the floor, and the president pro temp is banging. The press, pound, pound, is not allowed. On the, the cameras came rushing into the assembly. Cameras were not allowed on the floor while the assembly was in session. It was not allowed, and I said, oh my God, we're in the wrong place. I mean, I, this is what, this is where I come from, you know what I mean? I come down and I, I'm walking down the aisle because they had walked all the way up front. The president pro tip didn't even realize that the guy, that, 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 that I had five people ahead of me with rifles on their shoulder, resting on their shoulder, you know? And boom, and I said, come on you guys, let's get out of here, man, we're in the wrong place. And so a couple of white guys had ducked under the table. I said, <laughs> I said, hey man, I'm sorry, they led me to the wrong place, come on. <laughs> this is really how it happened. <laughs> now, <laughs> we had left the Capitol and they came and arrested us. We were well gone, long gone, we were sitting in the service station, et cetera. You know, and they came and surrounded us and arrested us, what have you, et cetera. And they, they didn't rest any of the women. We had six females, but they include my first wife, Artie. 
and she was with me. And uh, we had six car loads, what have you. And later that night, uh, Eldridge Cleaver's girlfriend, she was his lawyer, came and bailed me out. And I got back down. Anyway, a day or so later, I got my brother-in-law, Ted Williams, to bail out my uh, people, etc. And then when we got before the court, they only charged six people. But they had our guns, so we went down to the police area to get our guns. We're not giving you any guns back. You can't have any guns back. We went back and went to the court, got Beverly Axelrod, the lawyer, to tell the judge that they only charged us with disturbing the peace. There's no gun charges at all, and we want our guns back. And the judge ruled, and we've been back there and got our guns. The cops hated giving us those guns back. <laughs> got our guns. And our guns were loaded. They were loaded. We always, we would not go out there with unloaded guns just in case something really happened. I'm just saying. And we took the, we took the chance with that, you know what I mean? Now, that was all about police brutality, and it was focus. But my organization and us starting with the guns had more to do with the fact that peaceful protesters right here in Berkeley and Oakland was viciously being viciously brutalized. And peaceful protesters, you see, that, 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 that's what was wrong, you know what I mean? That whole year, we had no more than 50 people in the party. I had to serve six months, which I got out of jail in five months because of good behavior. But my point is, uh, that was in December, and Huey was in jail, he shot, etc., what have you, by Officer Fry, and so on. Now, I can't tell you the whole history of that. You can read about that, Sky's the Limit, etc., and so on. I got other books outside, but my point is, uh, the, the, the real growth of my organization really started in 1968. I come out of jail December the 8th. Eldridge Cleaver's was riding high. I ain't got no job no more, so Norvell Smith had to let me go. You know what I mean? But he came down, he says, Bobby, what are you doing going to the Capitol like this here? I said, man, I'm just trying to change this stuff right here. He said, they're making me fire you. I said, that's all right, Norvell, man. Fine, don't, don't worry about that. You know what I mean? But my point is, it was, it was really that in that period. And um, we did the pre-Huey birthday rally. And right after that, Dr. Reverend Raph Abernathy called me. And Mr. Seal, he says, uh, Dr. King would like to know, would you, would the Black Panther Party, be willing to help participate in organizing for the poor, his poor people's, upcoming Poor People's March? And I says, yes, yes. I says, you, he says, we are organizing more than 100 different organizations from all across the country in various cities all across the country. I says, okay. I says, we will participate. We will definitely participate. And I says, he says, well, what we're going to do, he says, once we get this 100 or so organizations together, Dr. King wants to set up a broad roundtable where we can deal with uh, you know, spelling out and, 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 and broaden the civil rights in terms of economic rights. This is what we're going to do. And I said, well, we will participate, we'll be a part. So in effect, people don't know it, I had a coalition with SCLC and Martin Luther King. And then Eldridge Cleaver next week put in the Black Panther Party newspaper, my Dr. Martin Luther King calling him a bootlicker. Oh, my God. Me and Elders Cleaver went around. He was the Minister of Information. I said, you are not going to do that. Oh, Chairman, he's talking about now. I said, you're darn right, nonviolence. I said, nonviolence is a constitutional, democratic, civil, human right. I said, and for anybody to, to beat up uh, peaceful protesters is violating the law of the land. So we defend our constitutional, democratic, civil, human rights. That's where we're coming from. I says, now I told Dr. King, we will participate, and those Black Panthers who, who, who don't want to come there, I says, well, there will be no guns coming when we come to your poor people's march. But anyway, we packed the Oakland Auditorium for the, for the poor people's march. I packed that auditorium, and, got, and then, you know, Dr. Reverend Ralph Abernathy and others, they organized, and that's what we did. And 
the few chapters I had. I mean, really, my chapters were just up and down the West Coast. And that first year before Dr. King was killed, I only had 400 members up and down the West Coast from San Diego to, uh, from San Diego to uh, 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 Seattle, Washington. That's all I had. And right at that, that coalition, what, five weeks later, they, they murdered Dr. King. And what, uh, the next thing I know, the, 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 some judge was gonna violate my probation. And then uh, a riot happened in Richmond, California. And I ran out to Richmond, California, where I had put up a youth jobs program, the first youth jobs program. In fact, the city government of Richmond, California, back here 10 years ago, gave me a proclamation for creating the first youth jobs program. And it was right at the time in 1964 when the Civil Rights Bill was passed. I quit my engineering job after three and a half years just to work in the grassroots community. And that's what I created out there, that youth jobs program behind the Civil Rights Bill. You know, but when they, Dr. King, what happened, it caused... Yeah, and riots was all over the country. I didn't believe in riots at all. I, don't, I, I believed in organizing people. That's what I believed in. Because even prior to the Black Panther Party, in the Watts riots, which was in 1965, we didn't start the Black Panther Party until October 1966. All right? So then I remember that Watts riot. We up here in Oakland, and that was in Los Angeles and all that stuff. What? 65 killed, 200 some odd wounded, and 5,000 arrested. And this is before the party started, and I'm working in my head, how can I organize 5,000 people rather than 5,000 people just getting right in the grassroots community so we can get some more political power seats? You see, and these guys with political power seats, I said, yeah, man. They got counties all over the South, man, where the majority of black folks are in those counties. In each county, a sheriff is elected. I says, now, if we, get the, if we got the right to vote, we get the people registered to vote. I says, what? We can elect some really heavy, progressive black sheriff, and if the Ku Klux Klan get to acting up, that sheriff can deputize 100 brothers and sisters and people <laughs> and go over there and kick that Ku Klux Klan's butt and stop them from doing that. I said, that's political power, man. We want some power seats. Oh, okay, man. I said, understand. So, so the city council seats, that they make the laws, man. They, they make the rules, et cetera, the city charter. I said, the, 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 don't you understand? This is what this is about. And that was my political organizing strategy. As the party, and Dr. King was killed, people were running, they joining my organizations, hand over fist. I'm going to every chapter and every branch. We need to get you out here. I said, go to the college, get to college, invite me to speak out there. They will pay me to speak. They'll pay all our expenses, et cetera. And boom, and once I speak to the college, that starts your community base that we communicate with the college. And wherever you're located in your city, et cetera, then the next day or the next evening, I'll give you guys a prayer. So I went to these chapters and branches to teach them the fine particulars and the methodology of effective grassroots community organizing. That's what it was about to me. That's the way I saw it. In other words, if I drew, I'm an architect, et cetera. I can draw the beautiful plans, et cetera, do all the specs and specifications, et cetera, take them down to the license inspection, et cetera, boom, boom, they can pass them. It's still just a theory. But when you build it, it's real. You see what I mean? So that's the concept. So my idea is I'm going to build an electoral machine in this country and chapters and branches everywhere. In other words, we was rolling through 1968. A lot of things happened, et cetera. By the time Nixon was elected, my organization had moved from 400 members up and down the West Coast to 5,000 members in 49 chapters and branches throughout the United States of America. That's how fast we'd rapidly moved. And it was in reaction to the murder of our beloved Dr. Martin Luther King. This is what the real program was and what really happened. And then they put too much doctrinaire socialism in our party newspaper, and I got tired of that. You know, simultaneously, what happened? Uh, I think Nixon was elected. After Nixon was elected, he had a meeting before he was sworn in with J. Edgar Hoover. 
the first week or so in December, Nixon's still not sworn in. Nixon is on the mass media, and this is the first time he earned the earth urge that the Black Panther Party is a threat to the internal security of America. And when he said that, and I went to look the views, and I says, whoa, now, I didn't swole to 5,000 members. And so when I says, wow, I call for a retreat. I said, well, every little chapter in every branch, I want two, three, or four people out of the branch. They got a week to get here to Oakland, California. I want them here now. And that's what I gave a directive. And, every, and they made it there. They made it here to Oakland. Places we could meet with St. Augustine's Church, another church they call the Black Church, where they let us use some Lutheran group, et cetera, and so on. Well, but anyway, that's when I took my little architectural skills and I start sketching, architecturally sketching, how to structure framings and fortify all of our offices because they are going to attack us. And I kept telling Paul Brown, you don't take this lightly. When this man said we are threatening the internal security of America, I believe J. Edgar Hoover and these people are getting ready to attack us. And that's what was happening. And as Nixon gets sworn in, and he researched for my own film that me and Stephen Edwards, Stephen Edwards right there standing there, he's part of me and my program, with standing by that camera there of our, our film. Stephen had found a research piece out of one of those archives frameworks right after Nixon was sworn in. Old Watergate tapes that had been made public. And he sent that thing to me, and there it was. Nixon, Richard M. Nixon. Now, J. Edgar, oh, yo, you want to do, you get, do these Black Panthers for me, J. Edgar? Well, yes, sir. I, I says, when you when you gonna move on these Black Panthers? He says, well, we we've been trying to move them. He says, well, you do it. Now, now John Mitchell's gonna be calling you. I mean, we ain't been charged with nothing yet. And these guys are talking about getting rid of us. You see what I'm getting at? This is what was happening. So it was the President of the United States. Yeah, that film, you know, talked about the, 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 that, and J. Edgar Hoover did this, but I want to say, this is what Nixon did. That president, that's where the fascism rolled from. And in that year of 1969, they must have attacked over 20 different Black Panther Party offices, raided them, and one couple of places just ran in there, Brothers was just opening the office up, didn't even know they were coming, boom, boom, boom. Shot it up, Brother Bell down in Los Angeles, just killed him dead, et cetera. Went, and went all over the place. I mean, that, that was, by the end of that year, I had 29 party members, 28 party members dead. 69 wounded. And in defending ourselves in a lot of these situations, there were 12 police officers dead and 39 police officers because we defended ourselves. They came to us and they tried to call us terrorists. They was the one that terrorizing us. You know what I mean? We weren't no terrorists. So what Dr. King did in his move to get all these organizations involved and also he told us we wanted a round table where we work together and meet on some basis, where we help to work out and outline a broad plan for greater economic rights. And I says, yes, sir. Uh, I understood it. I understood the whole relevancy of where he was coming from. In effect, the Black Panther Party wound up being coalesced with 30 some odd different organizations. I didn't just have what you call statement coalitions. I had to have face-to-face -face relationships. All my Chicano brothers and organization, the Latino brothers, all the young lords and other people, et cetera, all the little young Asians, the, the Red Guard, the Iwakun in New York, what have you, et cetera. This is the kind of coalitions we had. And then I called for a United Front Against Fascism conference right here in Oakland, California in the summer of 1969. And they were still attacking our offices all across the country. Finally, they arrest me August the 8th that year already forced Eldridge into exile. Huey was already in jail, convicted and sentenced, but Huey was found not guilty of first degree murder, not guilty of second degree murder, and found guilty only of third degree voluntary manslaughter. To understand that, that's half of a win.
because they were talking about putting him in an electric chair. Oh, uh, did they have an electric chair or gas chamber out here? I forget. Anyway, they were going to put me in the electric chair. They were going to put me in the electric chair in, in, in New Haven, Connecticut. But before New Haven, Connecticut, I had to go through Chicago. And that story, that's a mean story. Nobody can get it right, but I got it right. I wrote, no, I got it right because I experienced it. You know what I mean? Uh, it was three levels of gagging. The third level of gagging, the artist never had a chance to draw it because that was one of them situations where they brought me in, in the chair, counselor is up out of his chair, again telling the judge this is medieval torture. The jury members over there, a couple of them were crying, I think, what? but me, I'm over here battling to try to turn my arm up under this big hospital strap. This is the third day. See, in the first day, they put me in a little folding, metal folding chair. You know what I mean? And Mr. Seal, will you be quiet now? And I had metal cut my way. I had metal handcuffs on a metal folding chair. Clang, 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 clang. You're not going to have no court today with Bobby Seal sitting here being gagged today. Clang, clang, clang. And I'm saying, I want no constitutional right. You get in my constitutional right. That's what I was doing. So, I mean, uh, we got, I have a dynamic hell of a story that young folks, people, and others need to see on the big screen. And this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do this. To let them understand what the real story was about. All the counterintelligence program crap and all the lies and all the distortions, etc., which is still going on. Still going on. They tried to set me up here recently. Some old fake group supposed to be um, supposed to be for the Israeli people, and I, I, I stand on the right of the Israelis to, to defend themselves. But at the same time, I want the Palestinians to have a level of li human liberation. <laughs> See, at the same time, it's, my point is, and they was working through. In other words, they're still doing it. The Koch brothers. <laughs> Hey, uh, they sent out three years ago, first five years ago, I spoke at Seminole University, packed house, and I arrived a day earlier. The professor showed me on the internet that the Tea Party said they're coming out against you. I'm looking at it and says, I'm an old, dirty, rotten socialist, Bobby, and we are proud of everything the FBI did to the Black Panthers. And we're going to protest Bobby Seale coming here to Seminole University here in, Fort, in, in Florida. It said, blah, 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 blah. So the next day, they have 600 seats. They have to get 400 more seats. The place packs. 60 of these Tea Party guys walk in with their green hats and their green sweaters, what have you, et cetera, and their little placards, blah, 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 in the back. They introduce me. Well, some people must know the history because half the people jumped up and applauded when I was introduced. And then I blew. I blew for a whole hour. I talked about them dudes so bad. <laughs> them, the Koch brothers. Are, Koch brothers sent out, after that, the Koch brothers sent out to over 1,200 universities. Syllabus for teaching. They wanted their economic courses taught in these universities. And they sent these to some black universities, too. And they had grants with them, big time grants for departments and universities. The Koch brothers financed the Tea Party student type organizations on the campuses. They did, all across America. My speaking engagements, but in two years after that, one, I looked up, when I got no speaking engagement in Black History Month. I didn't get no, I dang, these guys are organized against me. You know, so I had to get on there and get me a Facebook and do everything else just, <laughs> just, to, just to get me to come back up. You know, to, 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 to. So uh, to this day, I'm only doing four or five, four or five or six engagements. I used to do 10 and 12 engagements. I mean, when I was doing those engagements way back there, 20 engagements, et cetera, my, my middle son remained. Boy, we got that guy through medical school, you know, boom, boom. That boy's a doctor now. He's a big time surgeon, children's hospital down in Texas, what have you, et cetera. You know. Those are the things we want for every last one of our kids and our youth, you know what I mean? You know, and my oldest son wound up fighting in Iraq. 
he was in Army, Army Reserves, you know, and come back here. And I say, wow, my son fought in Iraq, and he came back wounded from Afghanistan, you know. But my point is, we still caught up in these wars. We was always caught up in the wars from the very beginning. When I researched back in the day, when I was researching all my history, and Dr. Herbert Aptak had documented all those wars we had fought in, all the way back to the Colonial War, the German Hushan soldiers that the king had, uh, had put together and was getting ready to send them over here, and Lafayette was up there telling the guys in New England, y'all ragtag, you better promise some of these uh, 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 blacks here their freedom instead of train them to help you fight. But when those German Hushan soldiers months later landed at Rhode Island, who kicked their butts? Them black African soldiers. I'm talking about that's one of the first colonial wars. Yes, yes Christmas Attic, but this is other stuff I'm trying to tell you. You know what I mean? And then World War I, World War II, boom, 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 boom. We've been there. And I say we first class citizens. Even if they treat me like a second class citizen, we are first class citizens. We have to learn and think that. We have to learn and think that. And I tell you, if you're homeless, whatever, et cetera, you have to keep telling yourself, I'm a first class human being, I'm a first class citizen. So I'm just saying, minds, beyond beyond some of the transgressions of my buddy, my friend Huey made in the latter part of the days of the Black Panther Party, you know, et cetera, and so on. But beyond all of that, minds was about that my ideology was about power to the people. And to me, power to the people begets, if we can put it together, greater cooperational humanism. And this whole need for us to tackle this climate change. Sorry. Anyway, look here, look. It is about our constitutional democratic civil human rights. At the ten point, that tail end of my 10 point platform and program, I put the first, a para paraphrasing of the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, United States of America. And I try to get young folks to really read that. Because when I put it there, I had read it, digested, and understood it for what it was. It said, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for any one people to dissolve the political bondage which have connected us with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled us, a decent respect to the opinions of humankind dictates that they should declare the causes which impel them to get rid of that political bondage that they're subjected to. And the latter part of it, listen to me, it says, when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursues and invariably evinces a design to reduce a people under absolute despotism, then it is the right of the people to alter a change and provide new guards for their security and happiness. So my argument, my argument and my organizing, my very organizing was trying to get some political power seats. And Congresswoman Barbara Lee, oh my God, I've been knowing this sister that time. She told me I put them all out in the field registering people to vote. So I'd forgotten about it. I put 20 people in the field one day. But that was what it's about. I want, that, I want them political power seats. By the end of the 1970s, with a lot of people participating on that same line, we had 7,000 duly elected black politicians in the United States of America. <laughs> By the end of the 80s, by the end of the 80s, we had 10, 11, 12,000. In the 90s, I think we near somewhere 20. But it's more than that. When we said all power to the people, we're talking about those same political policies. Those political power seats are legislative frameworks. They make laws. They allocate monies, funds, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? And you see what the right wing is doing. We know what they're doing, especially with their repression of the vote. I mean, we pull together and get these people out here and get these young folks and everybody together out here, boom, 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 boom. We got to take back, I mean, yeah, we got, what, 90, uh, 90 representatives that t will tend to vote on a progressive level. We need three times that many in the House of Representatives. And we get the, see, that's the kind of stuff. And that's still the same issue. Those political power seats in a progressive way with progressive thinking, with good politics, et cetera, boom, boom. 
That's, that's what it's about. It's about a future world of cooperational humanism. It's a continuing human liberation struggle. Power to the people. Thank you very much. One more round of applause. I just want to say I enjoyed listening to you speak and I appreciate you guys putting on this lecture series and having a lot of young people come out here today like that was really a special experience for me so I wanted to thank you both and yes so if I can shake your hand one more time and it was a pleasure. What is it Thank you. Yes. As you can see everyone is outside here. Uh, there's a book signing going on. There's autographed copies of different books that Bobby Seale has written. Um, everybody wants to, they're, they're hungry for more. Uh, his speech was not enough and so everybody's grabbing these books so that they can uh, gain some more history and knowledge and get riled up and pumped up to be a part of civil, civil engagement and social justice. So we're wrapping it up here. We've had a great time. We've learned about some history. We've inspired people. We've motivated people. And what else can we ask for for the 50th anniversary of the Black Panthers?